Hello friends, Steve from Southern Illinois again. It is hot today, muggy. Fall is here, but we don't get a lot of color down here and the trees actually haven't started changing. But things are feeling feeling like fall, which is good for me. I enjoy fall. It's been a tough week, okay? told you last week that I had some friends that were ill with COVID. One of them has passed and the other one is hanging on by a thread. But the football stadiums are still filling up. Churches are still meeting. I guess this is the new normal for us folks. In medical circles, we're talking about just having to accept the fact that we're going to watch people die from COVID on a regular basis from here on out. I hope that's not the case. But for the time being, it looks like that's it. Something happened this week at the Scott House that um, was rather confusing, okay? Um, I got a package. Oh, just a second here. I didn't switch the screen. Am I able to do that? Yep. Okay, here we go. Okay, I know it's confusing. But I got a package this week for... A cast iron stove. Okay, this is going to be an interesting week, isn't it? <sighs> I'm just, I, I just do this to, you know, make it interesting for you so it's not boring from week to week, you know. Um, Okay, so I got a package this week containing a cast iron stove. The problem is, well, I had a birthday this month. Nobody I know ordered me a cast iron stove. And yet it arrived at our doorstep addressed to us. There is no record on our credit card or in our checking account of us having paid for it. But after three or four days of calling everybody that we know to find out who could possibly have ordered us a cast iron camp stove, we can't find anyone. <clears throat> And after a, a few days of calling around, Vivian said, you know what, I have this hazy memory, I think, of somebody saying that they were going to send you a stove. But I'm not sure that it's really a memory or if I'm just filling in the blanks. Have you ever had something like this happen to you? Okay. You think you remember somebody telling you something, but you're not sure that they actually did tell you something? Memory's a funny thing. When we check our memories, they feel so real. Like we really remember what happened. But when we get together with people we shared an experience with, very often our memories are divergent and over time they start diverging more and more and more. You know, Vivian and I often run into this in our discussions, okay? <laughs> we will try to play back a conversation, usually a conflictual conversation from the past, and we'll have completely different memories of what was said how it was said, how the other person responded. 
And Vivian will invariably say, I wish we could just hit a button and play it, play it back so you could find out what you said. <laughs> but we can't. All we have are memories. And then there's the whole thing of memories that aren't memories. Deja vu. Uh, implanted memories. Im uh, repressed memories. At this point in my life, all I can say is that memory is an imperfect record of the past. I trust my memories, but I'm constantly trying to verify them. And when I run into conflicting evidence, I just have to let the uncertainty sit there. <clears throat> Vivian and I, well, I've long ago given up trying to convince Vivian that my memories are correct and hers are not. Okay? It becomes an issue of, okay, the past is now foggy. Where do we go from here? Our relationship is more important than winning a battle of who is right. But at the same time, what happened in the past does impact our lives. And so trying to verify it as much as we can is an important function of living and an important function of relationships. So last week I broached the question, we were talking about Sabbath, and I broached the question, how did we get from there to here? From Sabbath being an integral, important touchstone in the spiritual lives of the people in the Bible to what we experience today, where for the majority of Christians, Sabbath either does not exist or... is limited to a worship experience on Sunday morning and the rest of the day is for us. Well, <clears throat> I've heard several explanations for this. Memories, if you will. The Sabbath was only given to the Jews, the Jewish Sabbath. Jesus changed it to Sunday. It was done away with at the cross. Today, let's take a couple of those memories and let's try to verify what, whether they're accurate or not. Okay? Now, I do this with a fear and trembling because any discussion about the Sabbath amongst Christians uh, is about as contentious as talking about COVID or trying to convince my wife that my memory of a conversation is accurate. But I think this is important. Okay, Many of you have known me for many years. Others of you are just newly acquainted with me. But you know that I'm a Sabbath keeper. So I want to share with you my personal perspective on what I think happened and trying to verify uh, these differences in memories. So let's take the first one. Sabbath was only for the Jews. If the Sabbath was only for the Jews, then we should be able to find this fairly clearly stated in the Bible problem was you can search the Bible from cover to cover and you never find that. Instead what you find in Genesis 2 is Sabbath being blessed and hallowed and set aside by God when there are only two people alive 
in the Bible record, Adam and Eve. There are no Jews, only the mother and father of us all. Sabbath was blessed and hallowed for all of humanity, is my take on Genesis 2. <clears throat> Even in Exodus 20, the, the Ten Commandments, okay, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then the commandment goes on to say, this doesn't just apply to you and to your children. It applies to your slaves. Well, today we say, well, slaves were property, and so that possibly, but these were not Jews. And slavery was not permanent in those days. You could be a slave and then not be a slave. And in the Jewish system, all slaves were freed after a period of time. <clears throat> it applied to their animals. And it applied to all of the foreigners who lived within their cities. <coughs> Sabbath was much more inclusive than just the Jews. We see that in the writings of the prophets then. In Isaiah chapter 56, <clears throat> the prophet Isaiah says, anyone who chooses to, to embrace the Sabbath becomes a part of God's kingdom. Foreigners, even eunuchs. Now that was significant because people who were mutilated were excluded, told not to come to church in the Levitical system. But the prophet said, if you keep the Sabbath, even if you've been mutilated, you become a child of God. And then I already shared last week in Isaiah 66, where it talks about the new heaven and the new earth and all of humanity coming together to worship God on Sabbath. So when I read the Bible, I see the Sabbath as being set aside for all humanity right from the beginning. It was never limited to the Jews. It was a blessing offered to all. This memory, this perspective that the Sabbath was only for the Jews, that it was the Jewish Sabbath, doesn't show up in the Bible. In, in fact, it doesn't show up until about two, three hundred years after Christ in the writings of the Church Fathers. So that memory, if we try to verify it from the Bible, we can't confirm that the, that the Sabbath was only for Jews. What about the second one? That Jesus changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Once again, if Jesus did this, we ought to find a record in the Bible. That's such a basic fundamental change. Surely he told us about this. Well, one way of looking at that question is to look at the, the Bible passages about Sunday. Now, spoiler alert, warning, okay? If you get a concordance, a list of all the words in the Bible, you will not find the word Sunday in it, okay? <clears throat> in Bible times, both in the Hebrews, for the Hebrews and for the Jews of Jesus' day, None of the days had names. Instead, they were Sabbath was called Sabbath, but Sunday was first day, second day, third day of the week, fourth day of the week. So if we do a word search for the first day of the week, you'll find that in the New Testament it's only mentioned eight times. And six of these are in descriptions of the resurrection. Six of the eight times are descriptions of the resurrections. We know what day of the week Jesus was resurrected on. 
Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 2 and 9, Luke 24, 1, John 20, verse 1 and verse 19. But far from doing away with the Sabbath, in these passages we find the disciples keeping the Sabbath. The women delayed um, delayed some of the preparations for Jesus' burial until after the Sabbath had passed. And they, they came to, the, came to the, the tomb prepared to finish the job, only to discover it empty. Now, when you read through the Gospels completely, you find again and again Jesus in conflict with his opponents over Sabbath keeping. He invested a tremendous amount of effort in trying to help them understand the meaning of Sabbath. Does that sound like the activity of a, of a person who is then going to turn around and say, no, oh, no, it's not Sabbath. We're going to change this. Okay. That just doesn't jive, doesn't, doesn't, isn't rational to me. Okay. Why would he spend all that time investing in trying to correct people's perceptions of Sabbath if he was either going to do away with it or change it so radically. Now, the, the seventh passage uh, reference to the first day of the week in the New Testament is in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. In this situation, Paul is preparing to go on a journey and the church meets for a send-off party at which he ends up preaching all night. Would this, in your experience, be something that would declare that the day that he did this was a holy day? In Jewish timekeeping, the day started in the evening and ended in the evening. So when it says that he preached all night on the first day of the week, we're talking about Saturday night in our time, our, our accounting, which means that he was planning on traveling on Sunday. It doesn't sound like he was keeping Sunday as Sabbath, The, the eighth time that the first day of the week is mentioned is in 1 Corinthians 16, 2. And here Paul is giving some instructions. He's collecting a special offering to take to Jerusalem to help the impoverished believers there. You know, one thing that isn't really made clear in the Bible is why the Jews were so upset about tax collectors and the Roman occupation. Well, it was because the, the Romans taxed colonies heavily. It's estimated by, by historians that th the average Jew in, in Jesus' day had to pay 40% of their revenue in taxes to the Romans. It guaranteed that unless you were one of the uber wealthy, you were trapped in poverty. And so Paul was take, picking up, taking up an offering from the other churches in other areas to bring back to support the Christians in Jerusalem. And in his instructions, he told them, do it this way. The first day of the week, set aside money at home according to how God has blessed you. Now, do you do your accounting during God's time? I mean, is that, is, is that a rational idea? That if this is holy time, that's the time that you pull out your checkbook and you look at your expenses and you determine how much money you're going to put aside for offering? This is definitely not a worship experience that he was describing. And to my perspective, this has nothing to do with a holy day. So those are the eight 
clear times that the, that the first day of the week, Sunday, is mentioned in the New Testament. And I don't find in any of them anything to support the idea that Jesus or the apostles changed the day of worship or the day of holiness from Saturday to Sunday. There's a ninth passage that is sometimes um, included as a discussion of Sunday, and this is Revelation 1.10. This, this, this is the introduction to John's visions, and he says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. That's how it's translated in most translations. This is the only time this term is used in the Bible. But there are multiple times when God claims a day. And every time he claims a day, it's the Sabbath. Jesus said, I am Lord, Lord also of the, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, that Matthew 20, 12, 8 is an example of that. And in the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath of the Lord your God consistently throughout the Bible, the seventh day Sabbath was stated to be God's day, his special time. Now it is true that the term Lord's Day came to be applied to Sunday early in Christian history. The first application of the term uh, uh, is found in the letter of Ignatius. He was a bit, uh, the bishop of Antioch of Syria um, about f who lived, he lived about a hundred years after Christ and um, <laughs> he was on a journey to Rome just like Paul took um, except that um, Ignatius was executed when he got to Rome whereas Paul appears to have not been and on the way, he wrote several letters to churches who, to encourage them. But interestingly, in Ignatius' letter that mentions the Lord Day, Lord's Day, he recommends Sabbath keeping as well as a celebrating on Sunday. Okay? It was not a change from Saturday to Sunday. He recommended worshiping on both days which is kind of not what we, what we remember happening. 150 years later is the next time that we find a clear reference to the Lord's Day, and that's in a go what's called the Gospel of Peter. Um, and in this Gospel, the during Passion Week, during the description of Christ's death and resurrection, instead of calling Sunday the first day of the week, it calls it the Lord's Day. However, it's important to remember that this gospel was declared heretical by the church, the, the, the church at large at that time, because in its description of the Passion Week, it denied that Christ died on the cross. Okay. Do we really want to um, base our position uh, on Sunday, the, on the change in, from Sabbath to Sunday, uh, on a document that claims that Christ did not die on the cross? that God actually left and left behind left behind this human shell who then had to suffer from there we have to jump down another hundred years before we find another mention of the Lord's Day now granted okay the 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 documents that we have from this era are very fragmentary for everything did you know that we can't even come up with a reliable list of the emperors of Rome? Because so much has been lost. Okay. At the same time, to say that the use of the term the Lord's Day to refer to Sunday was commonplace 
when the book of Revelation was being composed doesn't have support because it was 300 years before the term began to be used regularly in the literature that we have. This has been a difficult week for me in terms of preparation because if you hadn't got it, I'm a very relational person and I don't like theoretical arguments. But sometimes we have to examine the evidence. When our memories conflict, it's important to go back to whatever information we can find to verify what really happened. This is all we have time for today. Next week we'll pick up here and there's a couple of other memories of how we got from there to here that I want to examine. But I want to acknowledge that this is a difficult process. If, you, if you're not a Sabbath keeper already, I want you to understand that I'm not talking down to you, okay? We all want to be right. We all want to look good. We all think our memories and our understanding of the world are accurate. And it's unsettling work when we're confronted with people we respect who differ. Just like Vivian and I put our relationship as a higher priority than proving our memories right. I'm not making you wrong if your, pers if your memories are different than mine, if your perspective is different than mine. What I am asking you to do, respectively, is to look at the Bible yourself. Verify what you think you know. Verify what you're told. We have the Bible as an open book and can examine it ourselves. We don't have to depend on other people to tell us what is in it. If the Sabbath was so important to the spiritual lives of the people in the Bible, we owe it to ourselves to, make, be, to be very certain that what we think we know is accurate. Please be safe, my friends. Be prudent this week. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.